This conference will uh, now first be all, thank recorded. You. Thank you, Normal, for inviting me again to Blue Ridge. And uh, just uh, uh, one word of connection here when the, the multi university site actually, that uh, it didn't spread to the West Coast with Oregon State and Portland State, where I am now, but actually it originated in the 70s and I was the fourth director for eight years. It originated out of Virginia Tech. So um, I know you guys are above me, and and uh, but uh, down the uh, south uh, east, uh, outside of Blacksburg, and we were there, and and I had a great time uh, during my stay and at Virginia Tech. Well, um, the trust. I want to take you on a journey that uh, Dr. Marsha Willard and I uh, proceeded uh, back um, uh, 2000 or so as we started looking at um, the area of trust, uh, the center uh, we did and continue to do uh, action research in the area of uh, industrial and systems engineering and, and industrial organizational psychology. So when we take a look at things like uh, putting in lean Six Sigma, transformational changes with governments, whole governments like Estonia, or Botswana, or Canadian Navy and FBI, people we've worked with for years, uh, often the topic of trust would come up. And so in our monthly uh, gatherings, where we talk about subjects and subject matter and what to investigate, the area of trust uh, came up uh, at the end of the end, uh, again, about 2000 or so. And so we embarked upon a, a multifaceted research project to take a look at trust and uh, see where it's being used and, and what's the efficacy of uh, current uh, approaches to build trust within organizational settings, between individuals, and um, within teams. And, um, and then uh, what's the body of knowledge currently have to say about it and where, and then does that promote any additional investigation? And we decided it did because we didn't find the tools particularly helpful nor a good metric system in order to measure trust that you could then judge if what you did actually produced any results. Uh, and, and then over time, did those results stay? So uh, this is where it ended up with a text, uh, the trust imperative. And then in 2014, I was asked to uh, by Gold QPC, where I had uh, two books already, or two uh, desktop uh, size. I was asked to, to go into the memory jogger business and produce a memory jogger because we were doing large organizations like the University of Alberta with 140,000 employees that we were, I was training the trainer of trust. And this turned out to be their, if you know the, the role of the, the memory job, it turned out to be a, uh, an assist, a help, help that people can carry around that covers key lessons. And so uh, this is very much a topic that I'm, I'm in tune with and stay with. It's not an old topic. I look at it in terms of transformative change in trust, not incremental change or continuous improvement, not standardization of relationships, but actually what if you wanted to bump up and have a real gain in trust? So if we use a trust uh, metric, we just make it simple, one to 10, one being low, 10 being high, 10 is that you turn over you know, that one or two people, or maybe you only have a 10, maybe you have a nine uh, level of relationship with a spouse or a loved one, and and you would be feel free to turn over everything your own and that it would be taken care of with due diligence and, and uh, care. One on the other extreme is maybe you you check your wallet if you got in an elevator with them. It's really low trust. Um, and so if you take that uh, that simple scale, uh, then we'll, we'll, we'll start to dive into where do we see trust and how does it show up in the world? It's, you know, it's talked about the link, uh, links on team, links in the organization. That's common use. We find the word trust thrown around, especially in financial uh, uh, acumen and financial institutions. And you know this. It's everywhere. Trust is everywhere. We talk about in terms of politicians. Uh, do you trust them? Can you trust them? Trust and verify. Trust but verify. So trust isn't a new topic in, in world affairs. It seems to run. It's in the literature. It's in the popular literature from the Why Trust Matters. Leadership of Power and Trust, another text. You can find trust, the word thrown around. You can find it in, uh, especially in as we as we look at, uh, this is prior to fake news, but as you look in terms of the aspect, can you tr trust media? And we think about Walter Cronkite and a high level of trust, the 
American public had in him. And uh, Brian here had a little fall in that uh, his recollection about helicopter ride was kind of faulty. And uh, NBC pulled him off um, of the um, of the evening show because the America's uh, trust in him as an individual had fallen to a level that they wanted to replace him. He's back on MSNBC, but uh, I went back to my undergraduate alma mater where I, I had mechanical uh, engineering at Tulane University, and there was Dalai Lama. And what did he talk about? The basis for cooperation, trust and friendship. So trust and friendship, uh, basis for cooperation. So trust is a, uh, not a uh, topic that's unusual to you or 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 in personal relationships or business relationships. You can see it everywhere, publications. Can we trust? This is a question that's out there. And this was great, but so how do you determine that? How do you, even uh, HBR has, um, uh, every so often it has a edition de devoted to uh, trust building. And the last one, this is uh, a nice quote by, um, it was a US News and World Report review of uh, Frank Lutz uh, book, Win. And in that he says, um, he was asked by the correspondent, that, so being a winner is just all about trust. Yes, uh, that's what it is. Whether you're a political leader, a business leader, or a journalist, no attribute matters more than trust. Winners have trust in spades. Losers couldn't generate trust to save their lives. <laughs> no ambiguity there. Do we trust our cell phone? Do we trust our smart Samsung TV looking into our house? Do we have customer supplier trust? And in fact, the first text uh, on trust imperative was uh, uh, sponsored, I don't know what word you'd use, by the customer supplier division uh, at AESQ. So that was very, we, we also did a lot of work in looking at how to build, as Toyota did, trust between customer suppliers. So the value of trust. So why do we care so much? Obviously, that we care. But why? It's simply because it talks about time and money. When you don't trust, you tend to be double guessing, uh, doing double work. You stack the hierarchy high, many layers, uh, low span of control uh, in order to check work and checkers then become checkers. So when you don't have trust, the efficiency of the operation at a very minimum, we could go further than that, the operation of your life actually becomes more complicated because you're double guessing, you're you're, you're, you're uh, building uh, secondary systems to get the objectives you want because you don't trust the people or the processes that are there. So what was out there in terms of building trust? Well, maybe some of you did uh, uh, Wildwood or executive leadership uh, um, ropes courses and so forth with the trust uh, uh, fall and so forth. I, I could go into detail on this, but, uh, and I actually took, uh, when I was plant manager of the Kansas City uh, plant, uh, Folger plant, I took my executive team on a um, ropes course and it was fun and we had a good day outside. But the, the research doesn't show the efficacy of, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of sustainability of this, whatever's created. Uh, it's not bad to do, but are you going to get the bump which you were promised? Uh, much better to do real work out in the field, to be uncomfortable out in the field with customers and with tag teams doing that. Uh, uh, and I, I could go to a lot of examples of innovative uh, places that the senior teams have gone out into the workplaces uh, and built that tr inner relationship trust by doing the real work. Um, so uh, trust is about um, uh, building confidence within teams and self and so forth, but it's not always about going to 10. So. Um, Sometimes people confuse, well, we're at a trust level, and I'll show you how to measure later on. We're at a three, four, five. Should we be seeking a 10? Should you be seeking a 10 relationship with your boss? Well, there's already a lot written on that uh, in terms of optimal trust. So the coffee, you're not building a 10 with your barista. That's not the goal. The goal is to get coffee, and but that person is actually making things that you'll ingest in your body. It could be a terrorist, could be Taliban out there. So why wouldn't you go for a 10? Well, you don't. You go for what's termed as optimal trust, a risk and reward. And you obviously there's a lot of aspects of going to Starbucks and the organization itself, 
and the barista and other signs that you take in in terms of health code and so forth. But you're looking at an optimum level of trust where you can operate, but you don't have to overextend trust and work on trust because trust takes time, energy to produce. So with your barista, you say, well, it's about a it's about a three. I don't know anything about their personal lives, but they can make coffee and it seems to be done each time. They remember my name and that builds a little trust. So a three may be well enough with a barista. Keep that in mind because again, we're not after a 10 with everyone. We're after to bump it up to a high efficiency level for that uh, for that relationship. So what we did in, in the research methodology, and I won't go far too far in this, but you actually go out and ask people, list characteristics of a person, uh, but, uh, the relationship you have the most trust in. I did, we did find over the years, you have to, I still do this in, in large uh, settings. You do have to uh, specify that it has to be a living person. It can't be a dog or a cat or a deity or your plant. Uh, you really want to focus on somebody, doesn't matter who it is, and then talk about the characteristics. So you have them declare those characteristics. Uh, usually doing those in dyads and you have people uh, in pairs actually share that. And then you talk about the process of how that trust developed. And from these two lists, we're going to develop the key aspects of leveraging trust and knowing uh, uh, what trust is made up of. So what are the elements of trust that give you the chance to torque them and change them and improve them? And then understanding the methodology of which as humans, we build trust in all types of settings. But before we get there, you want to flip it on people and you ask them, okay, now that you have that list, come up with the list of characteristics of the person you trust the least. And what inhibits your trust uh, to, uh, to develop in this relationship? So now this is interesting. We find now that what the, the characteristics of the person you trust the most are the diametrically opposite of the ones that you trust the least. That's not the way it is with all human characteristics in the world. It actually is a, a great finding itself is that uh, if you, if you uh, I believe they're honest and I, that's why I trust them. I, they're dishonest, that's why I don't trust them. That actually allows you to focus more on one uh, end of the spectrum or the other. And if you remember Hertzberg work on uh, motivation, what motivates you is not necessarily the same things that uh, you need as hygiene items. Um, uh, to, uh, you know, as a, uh, as a, uh, just to keep a, uh, a, a, a minimum balance or a minimum level. So it's not always the case that the opposite uh, speaks to, uh, the reverse characteristics. So what did we come up with? Well, we got these types of answers. They walk the walk, deliver performance, cared about me, committed to a common goal, capable skill, um, actually capable skill, knowledgeable, able to deliver, come up short. Uh, but we did get some of those. And and then there's a way you can reverse by showing people list of characteristics and having to declare, uh, force rank those also. We did this with IBM, with uh, InFocus, uh, different, several different companies and different methodologies, small group intervention, whatever. What do we come up with? Ah, there seems to be three elements of trust, consistency, commitment, and capability. I'll go through each of these because these are these. this is what you need to sear into your mind. What is consistency? Uh, as human beings, we want predictable behavior. Um, uh, it's not so much, this is a little bit, uh, it is walk the talk, but I am willing to shift uh, my definition of your talk as long as you're consistent. So if you'll say you'll be there on time, but you're always five minutes late, actually that builds trust in the sense of your predictability. Now, it may take away from some when you say, I promise I'll be there at eight. I promise I'll be there at eight, not there at eight. But there's something about you being five minutes late all the time that as a human, human, I can count on that. Uh, I feel, I feel uh, uh, comforted by that. I have a friend that actually, she flew out of high school and college and I dated for a while and Nancy uh, uh, was always late and actually became a FedEx pilot and world balloonist, and she's quite an individual herself, but she lived in Paris for, min for many years and now has retired and lives in Paris, uh, or France, outside of Paris. But uh, to put French culture with Nancy's, I'm always, she's always late. I don't know how in the world she ever flew for anyone to be on time. But I, I could tell you this, 
I could always count and always stick a book of all y'all when we were meeting uh, to Europe. I, I'd always take a book because I knew she was always late. And if you'd been on time, I'd been shocked. I, I would thought someone had died. How about uh, commitment? Commitment is two forked. Two, two forked. We want to know that uh, it's comforting, builds trust if you're committed to the same things I'm committed to. So if we work for social services and you love the little children, I love the little children, that helps a lot. So you'll find that in, in organizations because a lot of people actually join because they're committed to the science of quality or they're committed to um, safe cars or whatever it may be. And so it's not uncommon to find uh, uh, at least a surface level of dual commitment. But actually, over time, if you're committed to the same foundation issues that I am, that's even better. So are you committed to the same foundation view of bringing up children, of marriage, of, it, it, God bless for me to say this, I'm at risk it, uh, uh, political um, views. And so when we, when we find that our, we cross over a lot in, in different areas of how we see the world, there is an increase in trust. But now there's another put forward to this. Uh, we may both care for the little children in our social uh, services organization, but that's not the same as do you care for me as an individual? And so often organizations will have a layoff or some disruption and the leader will come out there and say, um, we all love the little children and we're going to lay off half of you. And then can't understand why the half that were laid off, laid off are upset about being laid off. And it was that the CEO got it right uh, that we all cared about the little children and their health and so forth. But why'd you throw me overboard? Uh, why was I uh, ousted? It doesn't look like you cared much cared for me in the way you presented it. And there's ways you can present it. But it doesn't look like you cared much about me. I was just a worker bee to, to, um, to uh, serve that joint commitment to the little children. And finally, the one that show that that is hidden until it's expressed and then it shows up equally. Can you get the job done? Can you get the job done? Uh, your best friend uh, may. Um, well, the way I say it is that um, I was disappointed because uh, I went to the next door neighbor who was a was a uh, neurosurgeon and I told him my car was broken and he came over. He said he was good with tools and. And boy, did he ever mess it, mess it up. So he thought, I thought he was capable. He thought he was capable, but I don't trust him now. That wasn't as bad as going to my mechanic and telling him I had a headache. And he said he was good with tools. And he messed me way up in the head. So, so we see people in different areas of, of capability. And you got to make sure you test that out. Because you can uh, offer trust where it's not warranted to offer. So we, we do have something about capability. Now, I say it's not well expressed because sometimes you'll be bamboozled. Um, I'm going into an insurance business and I want to sell insurance to the family members. Well, family members say, I love him. We have a joint commitment. Um, he's consistent. He always works hard. He's consistent with looking out for us. But I don't know if he can, uh, well, let's say even worse, he, he wants to make uh, become a stockbroker and invest for me becoming an investor of my portfolio. I don't know if I can trust that, but you're kind of compelled because the other two show up on the screen. He's a family member. We always loved him. And, and that's the beginning of you losing your money because you don't know if the person is capable in investment and uh, in, 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 uh, financial investments. We have these three. And consider each one of these as a small C. So we have a one to 10 going in our head about capability. We have a one in 10 going in our head about commitment. And let's just keep it in a one-on-one -on -one relationship. And I have a one in 10 going in my head about consistency of the other person. And together, if those are all large, say eight, nine, six, seven, eight, nine, it creates area underneath the curve within this triangle called the big trust. Not little trust, little C, but the big trust. So overall, I'd say I trust my spouse. I better, uh, 30, 31 years. Uh, I trust my spouse at a high level. And then I should be able to go through and say, 
This is why uh, I give a high degree on capability, commitment, consistency. Now, what happens if one of those goes to zero? Well, the triangle collapses and you have zero. So this gets going to, let's do a little test here for you in this audience. What if I said, I trust Vladimir's um, intention to do harm, uh, further harm in Ukraine? And you came back to me and said, Does, are you telling me that you trust Vladimir Putin? And the answer is, do I trust Vladimir Putin? Do I trust him? Well, that's a kind of a, uh, we have to unpack that. So in a case, I said I trust his capability, his, his commitment uh, to do harm, his consistency to do harm. So now, now it gets a little swirly because I go back to this and I say, I, I trust his capability. He's shown that he's able to muster uh, you know, an army and, and, and do harm. He's consistent in wanting to take more, not just the Crimea, but more and more. And then how about his commit? He's highly committed. Now that's where I made the fault. Because I would say he's committed, but that's not a joint commitment. So his commitment to Stephen Hacker, his commitment to democracy is a zero on my list. So given that, I would say that trust triangle collapses and I say, I don't trust him at all. Well, that's not quite true, but I wouldn't trust him um, in any engagement with him. I do trust his capability. I do trust his consistency and i can see clearly what he's committed to but that's not the same thing i'm committed to so as a one-on-one -on -one relationship the the trust triangle collapses and becomes zero why is this important well vladimir it's not so important that not vladimir but as i want to increase trust with a person in the office i need to be able to understand if i'm at a five and i want to go to a seven to make the office work better, to make my relationship with my boss or, or, or my reports better. I, I, I pick somebody and say, you know, they're at a five. I, I want to go to the seven. How might you achieve that? Where are you going to work? Where is it missing? You need to do that analysis. And it's even better to do it with them with an assessment that I'll talk about later. But actually go through and find out which of those three elements is lacking or all of them about a five, or some strong and some weak. That gives you the, the area to focus on of how are we going to increase trust. But without that, you're just talking about a big word that gets awfully confused with small small T's and small C's. You're not really equipped to, 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 uh, to um, tackle trust. Well, then the second part, how do you do it when you've identified that stuff? What, what are the requirements to open the door to trust and build trust? So you're going to stay with that five to seven. Well, when asked that about how did you build the most trusting relationship you had or uh, what were the downsides of how did this relationship become the worst relationship you had, these types of items come back up. Having past experience, exposure over time, relationship. Now, that deals with the concept of knowledge-based trust or experience, sometimes known in literature as experience-based trust. And that is pretty much how we built trust over the uh, centuries of man being here on, in a social context with other people. Well, that's not our world today. That might've worked for in your area, just south of you in North Carolina with, uh, with uh, Opie and Andy and Aunt B. Uh, in Mayberry to make build trust is that you live next door to them forever and you knew them. And and if you worked at the gas station with uh, Gomer or whoever it was, you'd have a lifetime experience with that. Well, that's not the, the world we live in now. We have new teams being thrown together, new people coming in our lives where actually pick up and move out of our communities to new communities. Um, so the issue about waiting until I get to know you just in a passive relationship, that might be why we're we're hurting in the area of trust. Especially again, back in the office. How do I build trust quickly? Because waiting for it and just talking about the weather 
and the next month talking about what do you do during the winter, and the next month, and after year three, I know you have two kids. That's going to take a long time to build trust the way we normally are, are programmed to build it, and we don't have that time. So this, again, is stair step. How do I build trust quickly? Well, we also have to go beyond that and understand there's other aspects other than the knowledge that we have of working on the, as the animal human. The issue of personality-based trust. I, uh, I know those signs, um, uh, uh, the, the, the nervous laughter that has a, I've seen that before. So that means this to me. Even though you're a new person, I'm looking at your personality as, as a, and a template of other relationships I've had to let me know if that, you know, your eyes never meet me. Uh, he, he's uh, hesitant to go eye to eye. Well, I'll put a, a value-based uh, uh, judgment on trust based upon past relationships. Institutional trust, we're advised on institutions. Uh, so if you are at a cocktail party, we're talking about how to make money maybe on the, on the gray line and you tell me you're from IBM, that's different than, than telling me you work for the IRS. I'll just feel different about you. I mean, and I could be wrong on all of these, by the way. These are just, uh, these are these are factors that, that push me one way or the other. Uh, initial identification, you look like you're uh, trustworthy. You, you, you got personal hygiene or, or, you know, the way you comb your hair, calculates based trust. How much could this hurt me if I did trust you? And of course, the last you have something or how much is there to gain? Loaning a dollar. I may not want to loan you ten dollars because I don't know who you are. But Bill Gates asked me to loan ten dollars. I'd be right there because the upside is my my friend Bill. Uh, there's an upside. I I I imagine unconditional, conditional. Uh, think about mother's love, mother's trust. Uh, when you tell her, Dad, Dad may be sitting on the couch, and uh, uh, and the son comes at at uh, seventeen and tells mom he needs a uh, the keys and the some money because he's going to go to the library and study on Friday night. And, and mom turns it over and dad's just incredulous. How can you trust him? He's always let us down. You know what he's going to do. He's going out and buy beer with his friends. But, and there's something about uh, this unconditional trust that uh, in relationships we see, it exists. So how do you formulate for trust? Well, I want to, when asking these questions, these are the type of answers we get. I'll break it down real quick. It comes back, funny enough, into three areas. How to build trust quickly, how to build trust, period. So when I wanted to investigate these, let's take a look at these. You, to build trust, you do have to devote time. Now you can short change that or make it go quicker by stop talking about the weather in your first 10 conversations and get down to the foundation of individual. That's not being intrusive. That's really asking, why do you work here? Why do you, you know, what's in it for you? Why do you feel, I see that you asked up about this subject, why? So understanding people and getting to that depth of, of, um, of knowing what uh, others are committed to. Uh, asking about failures, how they handle failures. Those types of deep questions in a relationship at work will move you ahead quickly. And so when, yeah, it's short, uh, short time it in sense of don't have all this wasted uh, 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 backhanded way of figuring out people. Get to the meat of the matter, especially if it's important that as a team you start to build quickly and start working quickly. Uh, be able to uh, to examine your assumptions. I didn't say don't. You got tons of assumptions, and I guess more are right than wrong about who to trust. You're introduced, you know, to somebody by your sister. Um, uh, I tend to trust them. Well, you'll probably be right more than you're wrong, but you could be wrong. And you could be wrong by 30, 40% of the time. So this just says, let me just sit back and see what's driving my level of trust before I've even met this person. Or after I've met him, why do I feel suddenly that the person came to the door to sell me vacuum cleaners and suddenly I trust them? What was about that relationship versus the other person that knocked on my door 10 minutes before that I said I didn't trust? So this is you really understanding you in terms of where do you uh, extend trust and where do you hold it back? It's not saying change 
or or forego those assumptions is simply saying, see if those assumptions are still working for you. And finally, there's nothing bigger than risk. You can talk about trust all you want to, but without risk, you you can't build trust. People don't like that, you know, uh, in counseling and, and finding uh, broken relationships, marriage or whatever else. They'll come and say, well, this he's a he's a scallywag, you know, he's peaked on me all the time, and I want to have build the relationship back again, and and I want us to be like we were year one, and and the answer ultimately comes back to, well, you'll have to risk him, uh, uh, risk uh, the relationship with. Him. And no, we say, didn't you didn't you hear me the first time? He's a scallywag. He's not worth trusting. But you said you wanted to build the relationship back, and to do that, putting a ball and chain on him. And, and locking up in the, you know, after seven in the in the, in the basement isn't going to build trust. You can mitigate risk that way, but you don't build trust that way. So even in broken relationships, risking is the way out, and that's doesn't that's not so. Well, I'll I'll give you another quick one that may encourage you. Um, in the trust building uh, world risking what you're really thinking actually can build trust. So there was this, it was an art piece of research, but another piece of research where, and I'll just dress it up a little quickly, is that if uh, I don't trust you at all, I have a teammate I don't trust at all, we've been playing night because the boss is in it. And finally, it just comes to an head, and I finally say, you know, I don't trust you at all. I see how you, uh, how you uh, cozy up to the boss and how you tell half-truths and over, uh, over represent your accomplishments. And my, my teammate comes back and, you know, I don't trust you at all either. You know, you're at a zero, you're at a zero. Well, guess what happens if we truly were at zero level of trust, let's assume we were, and we break at that moment, where do you think trust has it moved from that conversation? And the answer it has is moved maybe to one or maybe a two, and it shows up this way. You know, I never trusted the son of a gun, but at least he was clear. At least he could speak the truth once when we had the confrontation. So this is really a gold mine. If the other one is a is a, a sad news, this is a gold mine. Actually, you can move trust ahead by by speaking to the the poorness of the relationship. Now, it's even better to talk about what you're going to do to move it ahead. But risk is a needed element. And it show that um, a man who trusts nobody, as a lot of quotes, you'll see that come back on this. A man who trusts nobody is after the man nobody trusts. And uh, Ernest says the best way to find out if you can trust somebody is to trust them. That speaks for risk. So when we're, when we're looking at the methodology of building the relationship with the three C's, uh, capability, commitment, and and, um, and consistency, then I will use the methodology of willingness to risk, willingness to examine assumptions, and willingness to invest time and energy. That is the way to open the door. Those are the hinges to open the door. And let me be clear, you don't have to do any of those. You don't have to build trust with the teammate. You're at a five, you can choose to be at a five. But if you exclaim, I want to build trust to a seven, something's going to have to change in the equation. You'll have to put some WD-40 on some of those hinges to start moving them forward. But you don't have to. There's no requirement to build trust with your barista or whatever else. Uh, it creates a different work environment. And, and, and we see that the performance of the team actually decreases. So trust has been... The correlation between trust and performance is high in terms of team performance. So we've covered a lot, and I want to zip back now. There are six units of, actually, there's more than those, but we looked at six areas of the three C's and the three W's and built uh, assessment tools in order to understand where the relationship was and then. Uh, after an intervention, uh, where did the relationship go uh, and on, on the assessment, and then check it again six months nominally after that. So there's an assessment for each of these. First is assessment on self. I'll go through that one briefly, but not the others. 
And Sel says, how much do, how trust ready and willing am I? Yeah. Then the one we focus, which most people focus on person to person. So an assessment about where am I, am I with my relationship with my spouse, my children, my parents, my brother, my boss, my whatever. Very helpful breakthroughs over and over again. Those are the ones I get testimonies about the most. And it's really the guts of stepping up and using an assessment tool to kind of go through with that person with the declaration, I want to build trust higher with you. But one-on-ones actually are the basis of a team. That's why it still stays blue. So if I want to do team it's actually uh, there's an assessment, a unique set assessment for that all team members would take. But understand that within a team is pretty much the the, uh, the culmination of person to person relationship and how those roll up. Now the next three are different. Between teams is not everyone knowing everyone. It's actually me knowing someone else on another team and representing that to my team, which now says how much does my team trust me to make that assessment across the organization that's like an IBM or or a big organization or how much do, trust do we have in the fabric and the things you can do, interventions you can take to uh, to move that up? And again, you can measure it with an assessment tool. And then between organizations, I go back to Toyota in terms of rat, rationalization of its product supply system uh, uh, in order to build, take the time to build trust with fewer suppliers. You can measure that. So each of these has its own, its own assessment. And they all revolve around three C's and three W's. And from that, then you can take action and actually say, where am I? Let's move it ahead. For you as an individual, you can do this even without the assessment question if you want to. Think about your own capability, consistency, and commitments. How well do you know yourself? How much do you, how well do you uh, uh, represent or uh, Extend that to others, your capability, your consistency, meeting agreements. And then what's your trust what willingness? Are you willing to invest? Are you willing to take a risk? Again, you don't have to, but this would give you your trust readiness assessment. And if you want to become a more trusting person, more open to build trust, you would work first on your own trust readiness. And again, the assessment would help you understand where you're where you are. Trust Jogger, I mentioned that. It has uh, simplified three of the assessment tools in it. Uh, in fact, you can see one right there on the on the front. Worksheet two, team commitment. And that's on the commitment uh, item, and you would have a team walk, walk through this stuff. And, or so it has the, the free that we that I chose to put into it was a stripped down version of the uh, my trust uh, readiness, so self one-to-one -one and the team. You'd have to go back to the trust imperative book to get the other three between teams within an organization and between organizations. I want to sum it up in the minute left. What does it build, take to build trust? Of course. Say again. Uh, to build trust, what does it take? This stuff is way beyond you all. I know it's not. This is simple. You probably already knew this inherently. It takes the issue of, of intentionality to build trust. It takes a vulnerability to build trust. So step out and say, I want to build trust. And whether you use these mechanisms or others, don't be in the excuse setting that I don't have trust with my brother-in-law because it's his fault. If you want to have trust with your brother-in-law, you'll figure out a way to overcome the barriers and even the hidden barriers to build trust. It's that clear. You can be messy and inefficient, but if you want to build trust, put that on the list and start working at it and, and just be, and there's tools to do it, but it takes that willingness to do it. Last quote, you can't, uh, you can talk water, even a straight stick turns crooked in it, but even a better one. We're never so vulnerable than when we trust someone, but paradoxically, if we do not trust, cannot trust, neither can we find love or joy. If you go to my website, uh, stephenhacker.com, you can find papers on trust. Uh, there's additional papers on, uh, on TSI. 
you want, that's my email, but you can go on TSI for results.com on our corporate web, website and you can get a lot of additional uh, uh, papers and journal papers on trust and different resources there that are open free for your taking. I'm a minute or two behind, but uh, uh, thank you very much. I hope this was helpful. And you're welcome to contact me if you have any questions or comments or whatever else. So, Naval, yours. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Uh, uh, thanks very much. Uh, if we we do have time for questions here, so uh, if you all do have questions, uh, please uh, use the chat box uh, to enter in your questions. Uh, now, there are some folks online uh, who did uh, go ahead and uh, registered for today. We will be. Um, sending out the trust memory joggers here by uh, sometime this weekend, probably by the beginning of next week. So you should be uh, receiving those soon. Uh, so that way uh, you can take a look at them. And if you want to perform the self-assessment uh, that's inside uh, the trust memory jogger, you can certainly do that uh, at your convenience. Uh, let's see. Tiffany has a question. Uh, could you go back three slides and explain the chart? This one? Yes. I assume it's this one. This one simply, and, and, and it probably should, uh, uh, this really is the heart of it, and, and it's a, a lot to explain, uh, and I'll go quickly through again. Uh, it says basically is that uh, in, in every performance area, uh, I can move towards my results being less than I promised. And I offer excuses and stories of why I fell short. But then I, you often find people making, a, uh, sorry, it's a mechanism that prevented me from making it happen. But then you'll find me uh, coming back and reasserting the importance of something. So Britney Spears comes to mind when she got married to her. A uh, high school sweetheart, and if you remember in Vegas, and her mom came and broke it up and paid him a lot of money and to annul the wedding, uh, the marriage. And so her comment, uh, I was in Johannesburg at the time, and I got the Johannesburg Star, and I got the quote, uh, uh, which is that it ends with this quote. And Brittany said, "I do believe in the sanctity of marriage. I certainly do. But I was in Vegas, and it took me over." So in this case, Brittany is saying, "I believe in." The sanctity of marriage, marriage for life, or whatever, and the sacredness of it. But Vegas was at fault. I, it was not me. It was that Vegas took me over and and thrust me into one of those cheap wedding uh, chapels on the strip. In fact, when they got married, that's one way of thinking about it. Another way of thinking about it, which is again applies to trust, about why I don't have trust. It's not my brother-in-law's fault. Is that I see that I want to build a sanctity of marriage. I want to have a strong marriage. But uh, instead of making that happen, it appears that uh, the, uh, the attraction of uh, uh, Vaca uh, Sodden sex, that was a quote in the paper, Vaca uh, uh, alcohol sodden sex, was actually my objective, although I, dis I claimed that it was a red star. So I can see where I went off course. So now in my next marriage, uh, I'll focus on those barriers of overcoming those and the hidden barriers and things that influence me. In other words, I'm uh, existentialism. I'm in charge. My willfulness will produce that star or not. And I often underestimate how hard it will be, but whether I get the star or not is of my creation. Now, other people participate, and some support me, some don't. But again, those are those are barriers or assets that I would use to make that that thing happen. So if I have a lot of money, I pack myself on back to being smart. If I'm poor, it's someone else's fault. If I get in a, a auto accident, uh, uh, no auto accident, uh, uh, safe driving, I'm a smart guy. And being a guy, of course, I know how to drive. I know can't drive. But if I in an accident, it's someone else's fault. So when you do that. And don't own up to the poor results, your chance of seeing the poor results about zero. So I own the testing relationship, good, bad, and the ugly, that I currently have. And if my life depended on it, this goes to 
goes all the way back to uh, kidnap, uh, 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 kidnap um, situation. If I want to change the outcome, I'll build a, re a, a relationship with that kidnap. That sounds harsh, but that's that's really at the end of the end of the tail end of the uh, spectrum. Other questions? That was a big one. Let's see. We don't have any questions showing up in the chat box at the. Oh wait a minute. I keep going. Oh, um, you were a little bit muffled uh, a couple of times while you were talking. <laughs> unfortunately, um, could you kind of hit on the highlights of what you just said once again, so that everybody understands? Key to building trust is that uh -huh. I first own the relationships at their level they are now. I own them. Doesn't mean other people don't participate and have joint ownership, but in a sense, and this is going to hit some people hard, I own it and therefore I can move it ahead. So I'm with my spouse, my relationship at a six. I want to move it to a seven, just like something, something small. Well, it really depends upon her. No, it doesn't. It depends upon me. Now, if she participates in it, maybe we'll get to eight or nine and all that. But for me to move it ahead, maybe I have to admit that I'm wrong sometimes. And maybe I want to be right more than I want to move up a point in the level of trust. Maybe I'll have to go to the opera. Maybe I'll have to macrame or whatever it is. I'm not prepared to do that. Therefore, I own it. And I, despite what I declare, I'm not willing to move it ahead. If my life depended on it, I could move it ahead. So own the results where they are. I have a loser or boss, we're at a five, until he changes his opinions, the relationship will never get better. Not true. What am I willing, and maybe you're not willing, maybe you're not willing to cozy up, or maybe you're not willing to placate your boss or whatever, that's fine, you don't have to. But once you say it's not possible, that's an, uh, that's a, that's an untruth. I can move that relationship does that help sorry i was on mute uh yeah that was much clearer uh than the first time not exactly sure uh, what happened the first time um tiffany was that okay okay She's saying yes. Uh, the next question we have, Stephen, is from Clarissa. Uh, besides your spouse, what's the best trust relationship you've experienced? Well, yeah, I would say that's a good one. I, uh, who else would I give a high number to? Uh, probably the typical. Uh, uh, people you would think my I'd give a high uh, my mother's uh, uh, deceased, but it would be my mom and probably uh, dad, uh, grandparents. Uh, and uh, I think there's a few colleagues I work with. Uh, you see Marvin Washington right there on that uh, the book that was least just came out this summer, uh, Lead Self Before Leading Others. I've known Marvin for 30 years, and we've uh, uh, co-authored three books together. So I'd say. And I know Marvin and and his children. We vacation together. Just came back. From it. I'd say someone like Marvin. So there's a there's a handful of people. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Any other questions for Stephen? It looks like we've got uh, a couple of minutes left before we hit the top of the hour. Um. Don't see any other questions coming. And Nora, Nora, do you have any? Uh, no, not really. So I'll test you. Okay. So what were the three C's? Pardon me? What were the three C's? Uh, oh, boy. Put me on the spot. <laughs> the three C's around the triangle? Yes. Uh, let's see. 
I, I can't what remember. What makes up trust? Elements of trust. That's okay. I'm not here to embarrass you. That's okay. <laughs> so I'd have people remember that it's consistency, uh-huh. uh, commitment, joint shared commitment, and capability. Can you do the job? Those are the three right. that you're you're looking at in order to describe a trusting relationship. And then how do you move it ahead are the three W's. Willingness to invest time and effort. Willingness to uh, examine my assumptions, the good ones and the bad ones that cause me to move towards you away f- or away from you. And finally, my willingness to risk within the relationship. So if you take away that from this conversation, three C's and three W's, then you can start seeing how you can leverage those within your own relationships. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, question from Kevin. Uh, do you have to trust yourself before you can trust someone else? Uh, good question. Um, uh, there is correlation between your level of trust of yourself, do I hide stuff from myself? I hide my car key, I hide money from myself. Do I, and it has to do with the way you see trust overall. So have to is a strong word, do I have to trust my, the level you build trust with yourself does have an aura about it in terms of me going out in the world and trusting others. Uh, fortunate or unfortunately, that's the way it works. So um, am I, do I have a good relationship with myself is a, a fundamental block. The other one that's kind of interesting, in fact, it's going to be published this uh, in about six months. Uh, I did on my own a uh, assessment of um, use of threes and three W's because I heard in church the trust word all the time. And I said, well, do I trust God? And I have an assessment on that. And actually, uh, Foursquare Church is publishing, uh, and Arthur Steve Mickles is publishing that assessment. and. Uh, a lot of uh, smart words around it of uh, how do I think about the, uh, the universe and life and life eternal? Uh, what I would say, that's another fundamental block. Even if I say there's nothing else, there's a void after I die or whatever else. Me being uh, having a trust of my perception of what uh, the role of a deity or the absence thereof plays coupled with how I trust myself, start to form a foundation of how I enter the world and make trusting relationships with my children, spouse, and so forth. That's a big one to end on, but that's the that's, that's whole thing. Do I, where am I on that? And, the, and the, on the other end of the spectrum, do I trust society? So apart from organization to organization, do I trust humanity? And we didn't do any work in that area, and I haven't seen work in that area. You still there? Yeah, I'm, we're still here. Uh, let's see, looking to see if there's any other questions. Oh, Kevin said thank you, appreciate your response. Uh, other folks look like they're saying thank you. Uh, looks like it's about a minute after one here, so <clears throat> we're going to go ahead and um, wrap things up for today. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Stephen Hacker once again for presenting for us today, uh, closing out uh, <clears throat> World Quality Day, World Quality Week, which we uh, offered the webinar series uh, this week. Um, any closing comments, Stephen? No, uh, uh, well, I say no. Just one, don't see trust as a, a fallout of relationships. See trust as an objective that you can leverage, that you go into to work. Just don't see that it's an outcome of hanging around together. Go build trust. Go, go experiment. See what you can do, especially with, uh, and these where, again, the testimonials come, with your children with your siblings, with your spouse or, or significant other. And you may be surprised how fast you can move it. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, we'd like to also thank uh, all of you for joining us today. 
we may see some of you uh, Saturday morning, uh, 10 o'clock Eastern time uh, for um, uh, Vic Nanda and his son uh, presenting uh, Saturday morning. And uh, that should be quite an event for folks to see if you're available and interested in seeing it. Uh, until then, I'd like to wish everyone a great rest of the day, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.